great siyata deshmaya. We are starting a second parak, and today I feel that the lesson that can be learned just from this first first part of the mission is so great that I want, uh, with Rashi's interpretation, I wish to focus just on this. There aren't going to be big questions and big answers. It's just going to be this simple shot of what the first statement of what Rebbe says is, with a tremendous tool, a kli. It is going to be a guide for us in our Avodah Hashem. So I don't want to go anywhere else. I just want to stick on this and recognize that maybe give some examples in order to clear, clarify how important this tool is. So Maharal writes that when the why, why does the second parak start here? Meaning Rebbe is direct descendant of the previous Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel. He, he could have just continued over there. But he says that whenever it starts a new parakel, this is true for Paragimel and Dalit also, it's because there is an entire new message being taught. A principle which is such a major principle that it justifies a whole new beginning. And therefore it starts with Rebbe because of the message this Mishnah is going to teach. Now actually there are four sections in this Mishnah. Today we're only going to discuss the first one. So I think this Mishnah is going to accompany us for a few days. The, uh, that shows the greatness of it. So the first statement is, that's what we're going to focus on today. And then he has three more statements of being careful for light mitzvahs, like heavy mitzvahs, like serious mitzvahs, and then calculating the, the, the loss against the reward. And then finally, the, the, the famous mission, which, which is often said in funerals, of no word is above you, an eye that watches you. And those we'll discuss as we go on later on. But, uh, on the first part of the Mishnah and the question really here that the Maharal addresses is if you look later on in the Perik well, it has a very similar statement which is asked with two slight differences and he's asking what is the difference essentially between these two so let's find it um, Mishnah Tess, Amar Lahem, Ezu Hitzu Veru, Ezu Hiderach Yeshara, Shi the Bakbahada. So there's a difference here. In our Mishnah it says, Ezu Hiderach Yeshara, Shi of Vorlohada. What is the straight path that a man should forer? Clarify. Rashi says, Shi of Vor means Shi of Roar. You should clarify it yourself. And later on in Mishnah Tess, there it says, Rabbi Yochanan and Zaka is teaching, say, Uru, go out and see, Eizu Derech Yishashi, the Bakbada, a man should attach himself. So it seems like there's a difference between one attaching himself to a path and one clarifying a path. And we need to understand what the difference is that they're referring to. So if we look briefly at the Rambam, the Rambam, when he just starts giving a clarification as to what the topic is here, he says, "Mevoaru shaderach yeshara ipulot atovot maalot amemetzuot v'pnei shebehem yikene adam lenafshot tochuna chashuva v'yeh minagot tovim bnei adam." So, according to Rambam, it's referring to what the Rambam calls the the middle path, the straight path. It's referring to which actions you should do, which are emanating from your character traits of how you're going to be behaving. It's not referring to should you keep Torah or shouldn't you keep Torah. It's not referring to what hashkafa you should have or a hashkafa you shouldn't have. Rather, it's referring to in an area where it's not clearly defined as to what actions you should take, which will be an expression of your character traits, actions that express your character traits. So the Rambam says you should go for the middle path. And today we're going to go with Rashi's interpretation because I feel there is a very important clear here. So very clearly defining what we're saying. We are not talking about how to choose halach. Rash, the Rebbe is not teaching that. Rebbe is not saying if you want to clarify for yourself what the halacha is, then this next statement would be a very, very bad tool, an inappropriate tool to know how to use, how to clarify halach. Rather, you should look in the post scheme ask your Rebbe and you can clarify the halach. But we're talking here about areas that are not discussed in the halach. Types of actions like how you should act in a situation with someone who you have a rough relationship with 
or when you have a debate about what you should do, what kind of profession you should go into, or when someone you, you need to you can open up a conversation with someone in order to build them, how you're going to build them, what types of words you should use, or if you have character traits which you want to improve or you want to fix, it's not clearly defined in the halacha, and you want to know well, what actions should you take, what path should you take in order to know how to improve that, that's what we're discussing. Let's say a person has some sort of an emotional issue that he wants to work through. You can't find that halacha. And maybe the solution for him to do is that he should become super nervous and scared and not do any action so he can find the next solution and just talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. Or maybe the opposite, he should not think about what happened in the past. He should just envision for himself what his future is going to be and then act as if he's already living in that future vision. How do you know these things? How do you clarify them? It could be that what will be very beneficial for one person will be detrimental for someone else depending on where their character traits are. The example we've given in the past, imagine you have someone who his nature is that he's quite uh, quiet and he's quite um, he's like all to himself and embarrassed to relate to other people. If someone else has the exact opposite issue of he's always talking about other people's things and sharing other people's secrets and he can't keep anything to himself. So the type of direction that you're going to give to the one may be the exact opposite of what you're going to give to the other one. And nowhere in Allah can you get clarity on that topic. So therefore, we're talking about clarifying, yivro, to clarify, to do bore. What is the derech yeshara she yivro And before we get to the answer, I just want to say that you, you'll find in Avodah Hashem that there are presumptions made that exist already in the question stage, which you may notice you didn't assume to begin with always. The Rebbe is telling you that should be your presumption all along. There is a derech yashar that a man can choose. There exists a straight path, which if you clarify what it is, it will be the right path for you. That's not always understood by people. A mistaken assumption, a false belief that a person could have is, I don't know if there's any right path for me. And therefore, I'm not going to invest in trying to discover it because who even says there is one right path that I can take? Why should I put in so much effort? I've tried this idea, I've tried that idea, it didn't work, and they give up. The Rebbe's presumption, his presupposition before he even starts is, Obviously, there is a straight path you can take which will lead you to Hashem. That's Pashut. That's given. The question is, how do you clarify for you as an individual what your straight path is? Because it's not the same straight path for every individual. That was obvious to Rebbe. And he, the way that he's asking that question is not informing you of that. That was a given for him. He's just giving you guidelines on how to discover. So now his answer is quite surprising. In fact, you wouldn't have necessarily given this answer yourself. Whatever is glory for you, and it gives you glory from other people. Now, if we take this on a surface level, we're going to look at Rashi in a minute, and we're going to read Rashi in a way that's challenging, and then read Rashi in a way that's enlightening. But it sounds like it's saying, whatever feels good, whatever gives you excitement, whatever you happen to enjoy, that's the path in life that you should take. And if you want to support that, then I'll give you an extra guideline. Whatever everyone else is doing, whatever everyone else happens to be doing, and, and they praise, and they say is the right path, that's what you should do. So let's just give an example of how to express that. If you, let's say, for example, have just finished something, and you are all proud of yourself that you have an accomplishment, and you want to know what to do to praise yourself and how to get rewarded for what you've done, then you should go out and have a big meal. And you should you really like the kind of thing you wouldn't normally allow yourself to do, invest and eat and eat and eat and maybe drink as well and, have, and get a little drunk. And then you'll feel high and you'll feel you're feeling good and that will make you enjoy yourself. And if you're not sure if that's the right thing to do, is that what the people of the world do? When they wish to celebrate, they go out and have a good meal and have a good drink. Is that what they do? If you were to read this Rashi on a superficial level, that seems to be the direction that he's giving. Let's see the Rashi, and then we're going to have a much deeper insight into Rashi. So Rashi starts off by saying, What is Tiferet Lo Seha? It's pleasurable for the person who does it. 
כל דרך שהיא נוחה, whatever is comfortable for you, וצי third למי שעושה, לאותה דרך יבור האדם. When I first read this Rashi, I, I was going to say, like, leave it, that doesn't make any sense. Sometimes when you read it, perish, and you say, there's no way that could be the pshat, whatever is comfortable for you, whatever you just happen to enjoy, then yadua, then you know for sure, שזו דרך שהיא נוחה לא עושה, it's going to be good for you, it's going to be comfortable for you, and then he continues the next point that he says, ותפרד לו מן אדם, and if it gets praise from other people, שלכל העולם יש רע, everyone says that's the right thing to do. Now what happens if you live in a society where what they praise is something negative? What happens if you live in Storm Vermora? What happens if you live in, and you can add in the name of your town now, what happens if you live in a place which the values of that place are not exactly in line with the values of Torah? And, and what gives you pleasure is not always in line with the value of Torah. Is that what the direction is? Rebbe is saying, if you want to know the straight path that you should take in life, whatever makes you, you feel good, and whatever everyone else around will praise for doing. That seems to be the pshat of the, the Mishnah, according to the way that Rashi is explaining it. And like we said a couple of times ago, that whenever you find something puzzling in the words of the Chazal, or the words of the Rishonim, then you know that there lies here a deep secret, and there lies here a message and a tool in Avodah Hashem that can take you to a much deeper place. And therefore, it's worthwhile contemplating it further and investing in it. Let's continue reading Rashi. Ein lecha davar avera shiyase adam shelo yitcharet ko. There's no such concept as doing an avera and not feeling regret. Every time you do an avera, you feel regret. Rashi says yes. Every time you'll do an avera, you'll feel regret. But you'll mar belibo and you'll say in your heart, Ma siti? What have I done? And not only that, but you'll also be embarrassed to share with other people what you've done. But if a mitzvah opportunity comes your way, so I want to clarify this idea a step further. I'm going to speak in my own words a little bit, and then we'll go back and read it inside. I'm going to speak about one topic in the emotional world just to get an understanding of it but then it's not only relevant to that area it's relevant to many other areas as well there's one emotional health area which expresses itself in people not being sure that they did what they did and they do a certain action and they say did I do that properly and they're not sure that they did it properly so they want to go and check and see if they did it properly or they have a decision to make and they're not sure exactly how to make the decision so they look around them at everyone else well, what's he saying what's she saying what are they saying and then they say oh well they're all doing it then it must be correct and sadly if you look at the world how people make decisions many people make the decisions in the world by what is social norm who are you voting for who are you voting for let me see the polls where they're holding, oh, the majority of people are voting for this person, he must be the best, I'm with him. What computer should I buy? Let me look up. What's the most popular computer that's bought by other people? It must be good. I'll buy that one as well. And people go with social norms because they don't trust themselves, or they're not sure they have their own inner opinion, or they're not sure there's any real inner world that they can actually rely on. So they look to the outside world to say, well, you tell me, what do I like? Could you imagine what a crazy situation would be if a husband and a wife walk into an ice cream parlor and the attendant says to the, uh, to the man, he says, which flavor of ice cream do you like? And he says, uh, one second, I'm not sure, honey, which flavor of ice cream do I like? And she says, uh, you, you like uh, praline. Uh, okay, I like praline. What do you mean? You're asking her what flavor you like? Well, let's give another example. What derech of Limud really speaks to you? Oh, I'm not sure. Derech Halimut. One second. Uh, Rebbe, what's the right Derech Halimut that I should be learning? Uh, what do you, what do you mean? Well, what works for you? Uh, how do you know? Okay, that, that's another example. Or what line of profession should I go into? Like, what's the de proper Derech that I should do? So, what I should do for a living? Like, I have to choose. Um, I'll go to a careers guidance counselor. Like, what's the best thing I should do? You just choose for me. 
it's too complicated. You just tell me, whatever it is you tell me, that's what I'll do. You just tell me, okay, that one, fine, I'm with that one. I'll go into that one. Now, some examples seem more logical, some seem less logical, but there's a basic lack here of one's inner world, of an inner trust, of an inner recognition that I have an inner place which I can rely upon. And that can be my guide to help me. So, did I already, did I wash my hands properly? I'm not sure, what, let me wash again, just to make sure. That's an unhealthy place. It's saying, my inner world isn't secure, so I need to find some external world, by like washing again in this case, to just clarify for myself, because I don't trust my inner world, that my inner world is telling me. It's very interesting, I'm not gonna mention names, but there are two halachic svarim, achronim, nowadays, people who are both alive, when I was learning Rabbanut, then I would always like to see the bottom line, Halacha, Halacha how do we pass it? And when I was learning Hilchot Brachot, I noticed this, and I noticed in other areas as well, that there are two modern day poskim who both pass in Halacha with extreme opposite approaches exactly regarding this matter. The one of them, I'll give one example. How, how do you know if you can still bench? What is the guideline if you forgot to bench and now you need to bench? What is the guideline if you can still bench? So the halacha states that so long as you're still satiated from the meal that you ate, you can still bench. So that's the guideline. Now, one of the post game that I read, he said, you just check with yourself if you're still satiated, you can bench, and if not, not. And he left it there. And in a footnote, he spoke against people who give specific numbers. Then the other book I went to look at, this other Acharon, and he writes there, 72 minutes. Now where did you get the number 72? So he brings the, the, the Gemara that it's based on 72 minutes, but he says, but what about the fact that Gemara says as long as we're satiated? So he writes, we can't rely on ourselves to know if we're still satiated, because who can know if you're already satiated or not? 72 minutes, blank, you rule, fixed. Now that's two opposite approaches entirely within Halach, within the post -kit. One post is saying, you can rely on yourself. And if Hazal tell you that the measure of how to know if you can still bench is if you're satiated, then Hazal trust you. And they trust in your opinion of your own judging of yourself that I feel satiated, I can still bench. And the other person is saying, we don't want to go there. We don't want to say, you will save yourself, you won't save yourself, you're going to give the Torah over to the people, who even knows what is going on in the inner world? We'll make a fixed rule, a blanket rule, across the board, everyone has to follow suit, and this is the halach. The, the people come from two ties and ashkaf, also the belief, without connection, but also their lifestyles of those two rabbanim, the types of communities they live in, who they are, also is greatly reflected in that derech Now, when you're coming to a halachic question, there's nothing to talk about. And I want to give you a, a story that I heard, which is a very, very hard, challenging story. But just to make it very clear this point, I'm giving the most extreme story I could give. Let's imagine for a moment that there is a Ger who dies without any Yoshim. So the halacha is that his, his property now is Hector. Anyone who wants to come and take it can take it. So there's an Almana who has 12 children and doesn't have any money. And she sees the treasure chest that he's left behind. And she says, thank you for the gift that you've given me. And she runs over to it and she lies flat on it to make sure that it's hers. Then comes a miser who is super wealthy and doesn't need his own money. He definitely doesn't need any more money, but he's happened to be holding more halach of this amana is. And he says, you know, if you lie flat on a treasure chest, that's not a kinyan. And he goes and he takes out from underneath the amana and he does a kinyan on it. And now they go to the basement and she says, I need the money, I don't have any money, and I am an Almana, and it says the Torah, you should have mercy on Almana, and I have 12 years sold in children, please rabbis have mercy. And then the other guy says, I don't need the money, but Allah has Allah, I did it, Kenyan, it's mine. So what do the base din say? According to Allah, the miser gets the money. And you might say that goes against every fiber in my body, it can't be, it's not right. And it's not Yasha. It's not Yasha. But we're not asking what's Yasha. We're asking what's the Halacha. And when the Halacha defines something as Halacha, you go with the Halacha. Now the base, they could put pressure on this individual. And they could say to him about good midas 
and they can say to him that what reward they'll get in Olam Haba. But if they're past getting din, like we spoke about in the last mission, that din they make for shalom. If they're past getting din, the din is that he gets to keep it. And if he's stubborn about it and he wants it, he's going to get it. And this whole Mishnah would not help anything. But it, it would be good Musa for him, but it wouldn't be the guideline on how to pass it. So if you're going to an extreme of what's a halachic topic, then this doesn't go come close. We're not even going to discuss what feels yashar to you. But here's where we get to the level of midas, character traits, building one's inner world. Let's just go back to the first example we opened with. Imagine you have a person who's davening, and he's in his davening, and he's davening well, but then he's not sure if he said Shem Hashem, or let's not go so, so challenging, because that's a whole halachic issue. But let's say he's not sure if he had Kavana when he said Shema, and, and he's thinking maybe he should go back and say Shema again. Now, if you push him to it, if you push him and you say deep, deep down, do you know? Then he would say, I know I had Kavana. I know, but, 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 but maybe I didn't, maybe, maybe that wasn't really considered Kavana, maybe, maybe it wasn't. So now he is a, a fight between his inner Yashras, his inner knowledge of being Yashar, of knowing what's correct, of having a Derech Hashar Shivor Adam, that he has the inner world and then he has these outside complications, Machshavot Rabot. All these, maybe not, maybe yes, who says that's considered Kavana? You can't really define what the level of Kavana is. So you can never ever reach it anyway. So do it again, then again, then again, then again, then again, then again. He says, that's crazy. I have an inner world that I can rely upon. I have an inner Yashras. I can go with that inner Yashras and I'll be safe. So he stands there in the middle of his Shemais, in the middle of his Shema. And he's saying, should I go back? And he says, if I go back, that won't be Yashra because it's endless and it's not logical and I know in my inner world deep down my inner voice I know that I said Shema with a level of Kavana which is enough and he says fine I'm continuing and that act of continuing is aligning himself with his inner Yashus he's borer for himself to be Yasha and he will know from within that it's good for him he will know and there's no proof you can know because the whole concept of inner yashras is it's something which doesn't work with external logic. It doesn't work with, it makes sense that I should do it because, because most people who say Shema probably have Kavana, so probably I had Kavana, so I'm like, no, 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 don't go there. Don't try and prove to yourself that you probably had. No, you just, you know because you know, because you have an inner world. And Hashem made you Yashar. Hashem made you in a way that if you're being honest and you're being sensitive and you're not being complicated and you can tune into that inner yashar world and you will know because you know not because you need someone to give you guidelines and box you in and say well if you're in this area you're safe but because you just have an inner recognition that you know and a way of telling if you're not sure sometimes you're saying but i don't even know what's yashar i don't even know what's right so a way of telling is that Sometimes a person has such a crazy mindset and a crazy of if and if and maybe and it's all like gone crazy. You say, well, what if you would say that all those maybe to someone else? Would they buy it? Would they accept that? If you would say, but maybe that's not considered Kavana, would someone else accept that? Or would they say, I don't know, that sounds far-fetched to me. So that's what Rashi's coming into. Rashi's saying, Rebi Omer, Rebi is giving us guidance. What is the straight path that when you need to clarify between what's external and what's being yashar, your inner world, how do you clarify? How do you know? Answers Rebbe. Kol When you know, you will feel this sense of enrichment. You will feel the sense of that makes sense, not because I need any end of the proof. Because it's deferred la'oseya. It makes me. It makes me recognize who I am. It gives me an inner sense of being yashar. And I can't prove that to myself or to anyone else. But I know just because I know. And then Rashi goes further and says, and if you have any doubts about it, then imagine if you would say to someone else, would they buy what you're saying? 
partner, you know in your inner deep world that if you would start saying all your snakes Vegas to people, maybe not, then they, they, they wouldn't really understand where you're coming from, unless they're super empathetic and they're just doing you a favor. But if they're just being yashar, then they would say, yeah, I know, that, that doesn't make sense. Because that's just not a normal way of thinking so much. So if you want to test it, then say, Ferret lo min ha'adam. Check it out. You don't have to actually say it to someone else. You look at the words of Rashi, he doesn't say ask someone else and look what's a social norm. He does not say that. He says, look within yourself. If you were to do it to someone else or check in with someone else, then how would you feel? But your ma believe, Rashi said, and say within your inner world, Ma city, the yesh lo boshit me bene adam. Even if no one else is watching you, you all say this to yourself. I would feel embarrassed to share this pattern of thought to someone else because if I'm being honest with myself it's a bit far-fetched and I don't think it's yasha now this sounds obvious to us now but we're talking about it outside the situation but when a person is only within his inner thoughts and he's not expressing it to someone else or if he's not aware that he has a true inner compass of being genuine and authentic and Hashem made you yasha because your basis your inner world is yasha you're not aware of that deep concept then a person can go very far. And his inner world, he can create all sorts of structures, which at the beginning, he's aware that they're not so logical, but as they develop and develop, it becomes a new world order within his inner mind. And he feels no one understands me and no one gets me and no one understands who I am deeply. And it's all built upon, built upon, built of an external structure, which if you just press that bottom card, it could all collapse. But he's so in that world, then it will be hard for him to recognize that it's not true. And he holds on to it. This is my world. This is my world. And what Rebbe is instructing us is that you can believe that Hashem made you Yasha. You can get back to that place of being authentic and genuine. And if you doubt it, then just check it. You think it's obvious that you would say to someone else that it would be obvious to them too. This principle can not only save us from inner turmoil, but it can also save us from external turmoil. Because the way that the people live their lives today is so dependent on what everyone else is thinking. They don't trust themselves with their inner, inner world. They rather look to structures they've made or what everyone else is thinking about them and saying to them. Without the deep recognition, I can rely on myself. And again, I'm not talking here about halacha. Halacha, we have Masora, we have Sake Halacha, we have Rabbonim, we go to them for halacha. That's an external thing. But we are talking about what's going to build you, what's going to bring you close to Hashem, what's going to give you emotional stability. The derech hayashar, you have to clarify, Rabbi said. It's not obviously going to be laid before you. You will have both paths. You will have the yashar path and a non-yashar path. It will be laid out before you. But you have the ability, and only you, from within, have the ability to choose that inner path. Learn to trust your inner world. Make the decisions based on what most makes sense to me in my inner world at this point. This is also true in Derech HaLimud. This is also true in learning a particular sugya. Does it make sense to me? Is this how I would have learned it? If this Rishon gives an answer, do I accept that answer? Does it, does it rest well with me? Is that what I, my inner world would have accepted that? And you learn to trust that you have a deep, rich inner world. And at that point, you connect to your Nashama. That Yashus that Hashem made you. That inner Nashama that Hashem made you, Yashar, close to Him. When you accept that concept and you align yourself with that inner yashras, you start to feel enriched. It comes from within. It comes from within because it's a true sense of living. You're now living your life according to the way, the natural way that a Kodesh Baruch Hu made you. Life in Avarad Hashem is not external structures. It's a natural, natural service of a Kodesh Baruch Hu. That's the first principle. And now you can understand what the Maharal was saying, why we had to start a new peric over here. Because until now, we were talking more about external things. Din and Met and Shalom. We're talking about more world order and systems upon which HaKadosh Baruch Hu built the world. But now we're going into our own inner world. It's a whole new beginning. Getting identity of who we are. And that's the first principle of the Red Teacher. That's Kol Shiki Thret Lo That's your inner world and it will, it will speak for itself. And if you're not sure, then just see if you would try and run it by someone else. That's your third law in Have a good evening.